to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join in me, glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wonderfully reigned. Shielded thee under his wings, he so greatly sustained. Hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in what he ordained? Praise to the Lord who doth prosper thy work and defend me. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attain me. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he be to the Lord, oh, let all that's within me adore Him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Let the Amen sound from His people again. forever adore Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly forever adore Him. You were the Word in the beginning, one with God. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, our King. What a beautiful name it is! Nothing comes. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you
Declare with the rest of creation that all glory, honor, power is yours forever and ever. Your sovereignty is evident. And we thank you that we are a small part of the plan that you are unfolding. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, you can have a seat for a couple moments. Good morning, everyone. We're going to um, review some scripture together, and then we'll go ahead and enter our time of communion this morning. So uh, I'm going to be reading a passage from Luke 24. They were talking with each other. Oh, this is about Jesus encountering two disciples after his resurrection, just so we know where we are. So they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. 
He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And then they continue to describe and discuss Jesus' own crucifixion with him. And he replies, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village in which, to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. So I wanted to read this section of scripture today because I think this is just a beautiful picture of what Christ's life, death, and resurrection does for us. It says right here in scripture that Jesus himself came and walked alongside them. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us, and it helps reveal the scriptures to us. Christ walks alongside us. He sits in this intimate space and breaks bread with us. We get to partake in an intimate relationship with Christ all because of his sacrifice. And so this morning, as we take the elements, they're up here at each corner and also along by the doors. If you want to go and gather your elements and take a moment and just pray with Christ and reflect on all that he's done for you and actually take a moment to step into the intimacy that he's calling you to um, and take a moment and, and just pray. And so we'll pray together and then we can also all partake together. Lord, thank you so much for those gathered here this morning in your name. Thank you for your intimacy that invites us to fellowship with you, to call you friend, and to call you Lord, that your way brings life to us. And I thank you for the sacrifice that you delivered on the cross and your resurrection that provides an intimate relationship for us to grow and learn every single day, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their hearts. Blessed are the tears of all the weary, pouring like a sky of fallen stars. Let's stand and let's sing this together. Blessed are the wounded. Blessed are the wounded ones in mourning, brave enough to show the Lord their scars. Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. Blessed are the ones who walk in kindness, even in the face of great abuse. Blessed are the deeds that go unnoticed, serving with unguarded gratitude. Blessed are the ones who fight for justice, longing for the coming day of peace. Blessed is the soul that thirsts for righteousness, welcoming the last, the lost, the least. 
the kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. It's on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Your eyes on him. Oh, 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 blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones who suffer violence and still have strength to love their enemies. Blessed is the faith of those who curse in the air. As though they fall, they'll never know to fear. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. Lord, we thank you that the economy of the kingdom of God is unlike the economies of our world. One where love and joy and patience and reconciliation are the currencies. Just as you have reconciled us to you, may we reconcile others. Bring them into our fold and love them as the way Christ loves. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, church, you can have a seat. Well, we're in the midst of this series called Eight Traits. We're talking about eight important traits of people who are growing in their relationship with Jesus Christ. These are not, uh, an exo- this is not an exhaustive list of things. If you do these eight things, then you'll get God's grace, you'll, you'll get God's love, you'll be worthy of his love. It's not anything like that. God loves you no matter what. No matter what you do, God loves you. God doesn't love anyone here or watching online. Welcome online if you're watching this online. God doesn't love any of us any more than he loves any of the rest of us. In fact, God doesn't uh, ever change his amount of love for us. He loves us in such a way that we cannot uh, even imagine. Think about the person in your life or the people in your life that, that you love the most, and, and that's not even a shadow of how much God loves you. So, as followers of Jesus, then, then we, wouldn't we want to do things that would honor God? And, and that's just the thing, not to get 
into God's good graces, but as a response to what God has done for us through Jesus. Well, we're going to talk about a tough topic today. We're going to talk about purity because purity is very important to God. If you look in the Old Testament of the Bible and you look at the emphasis that God has on things that are pure, not just people, but things that are pure. Of course, he sets up this whole sacrificial system in the Old Testament so that in order for people to be pure or forgiven for their sins, for God to see them uh, without sin, to, for forgiveness of sins, he had all of these purity uh, uh altars that, that people would go to. They would sacrifice animals. They had all of these different things that he outlined for the Jewish nation to do to be pure. If you look at the places of worship in the Old Testament, which really, in essence, the tabernacle, which was kind of a traveling church, okay, a tent church, so to speak, and the temple, purity was very key in the building of those things. If you think about the furnishings of the temple, they were made out of pure gold. You look at the oils and the incense that was used for worship purposes in the temple, and they were to be pure in their substance. Priests had to go through purification processes before going into the temple, before doing their ministry. So purity from the very beginning was important to God. In fact, everything was pure with the first man and woman until the third chapter of Genesis where, where Adam and Eve lost their purity because of sin. And when the sin came into the world, then purity came into the world, or lack of purity came into the world. In the New Testament, we see this theme of purity continuing to be highlighted. Jesus talks about purity a lot. He talks about cleanliness, spiritual cleanliness, which is purity, right? Being free from sin, purity. If you go on in the New Testament, Paul talks over and over again about purity for followers of Jesus. The book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, describes heaven. And when it describes heaven, you see this idea of purity being important to God. So much so that the streets of gold, of pure gold... In heaven, which is that something kind of neat to, to think about is pure gold streets. You see something that's beautiful, that's gold, and you're like, oh, that's beautiful, right? You see somebody's engagement ring and it's gold. You're like, oh, that's so beautiful. And, and here's a neat take on the streets of gold in heaven for you. And we're going to do a, a, at least an eight week series on heaven right after Easter. So I'm excited for that. But think about streets of gold. Streets in Kansas, or if you go out here outside of the church and you start driving, pretty soon, what, what are the streets made out of? Dirt, right? Rocks, asphalt, concrete. When you think of those things, you don't really think about pure, do you? Yeah, we don't really think about when we're on the road, what the substance of the road is, right? We don't even really notice it unless there's like huge potholes, right? So in heaven, heaven's going to be so beautiful that when you're in heaven, the streets are made out of something that our streets, we don't even notice. So if heaven streets, are, or you think we're going to get there and go, look at these gold streets, maybe we will. But maybe everything else will be so pure, so beautiful, so perfect that we don't even notice the streets of gold. Just something to think about today. That was not a theological statement. It's just something that I wonder about sometimes. It talks about a pure river running through the garden. 
in the book of Revelation. So purity is important to God. There's a lot of ways that we are called to be pure as Christians. We're to be pure in our actions, our motivations, our thoughts, our forgiveness towards others. We're to be pure in our repentance and how we talk to God and so on. Today, I'm going to focus on something that most people go to when I, when I mention the word purity, and that is the area of sexual purity. I'm going to focus on something today that millions struggle with in our world. And contrary to the messages that we hear constantly, God desires purity from us. Sexual purity is a virtue that has all but disappeared in our culture. And some of you are like, well, when did this happen? Well, some of you that grew up in the 60s, you know when it started, right? It started before the 60s. But in the 60s, did things take a huge turn when it came to the emphasis on sexual purity? It did. Has, have any of you seen the Jesus Revolution movie? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay, this is, this is the time that you can like, okay. Yeah, several of you have it. Isn't it good? It's a good movie. But it really talks about these these young people, these hippies, we call them. And I wasn't around in the 60s, but some of y'all were. <laughs> Why are you giggling? Like, what made that funny? <laughs> y'all were around in the 60s, some of you, and, 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 and you witnessed it. You may have taken part in it, but we're not going to judge you for that because you're a new creation, right? And we see thousands and hundreds of thousands of young people rebelling and trying to find fulfillment in things that their parents were pretty worried about. And then we had this group of people during that time who decided that sex, drugs, and rock and roll were not going to bring them fulfillment. And then there was this movement called the Jesus Movement. And it, it, what, what, what it did, or one of the things that came out of it was um, contemporary worship music. Now, you saw a, a, a worship team today that was, that was smaller than it usually is, right? But the beginning of that movement started with the Jesus movement in the 60s. But we know that the uh, sexual um, temperature of America changed in the 1960s and in the 1970s, and it has continued to deteriorate. I want to share with you some statistics because our society is so sexualized. The temptations are everywhere that we look. Here are some statistics from the Barna Group. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the Barna Group is a, is a Christian organization, but it's a very well-respected, even outside of, of Christian circles, for their ability to do statistics accurately. And I want to share some things with you. I'm going to give you some numbers, and then I'm going to tell you. And I, and I read a whole list, but I, I thought about sharing the whole list with you, but I'm like, man, that's going to be depressing if I just go through every one of these stats. So I just picked out a few. 370 million. You know what that number is? That's the number of pages of pornography online. 370 million. 40 million. This is how many Americans regularly visit pornography sites. 42 million, the number of pornography sites. So about one pornography site per person who visits them. 300% the rate that marital infidelity increases with pornography in the home. And 11, the average age a child is first exposed to pornography. <clears throat> and I got to tell you, as I was studying for this and reading those statistics, I just realized how much my heart hurts. My heart hurts for children who are exposed to things that they didn't ask for, things that they should never have to see. I hurt for people who have fallen into sexual temptation and they feel like they're used goods. They feel like uh, because of the sexual sin that they've had in their life that they're used goods and that they're not worthy. I hurt for the couples whose relationships are in jeopardy 
or even destroyed because of porn addiction or because of extramarital affairs. My heart hurts for the young people who feel that it is impossible to live a life that's sexually pure in today's world. I hurt for those who have been worn down by the constant messages that present sexual sin as normal and acceptable. And I hurt for all those who are stuck in sexual sin and who have constant guilt and shame knowing that this isn't what God has for them. I want to talk to you today about a couple guys that I know. We're going to call him, we're going to call these guys Joe and Dave, okay? We're going to call him Joe and Dave, and, and I know quite a bit about these guys. Let me tell you what I know about Joe and Dave. Joe and Dave are uh, uh, both very handsome men. Joe and Dave are very, both very gifted men. Both uh, Joe and Dave love the Lord, and both Joe and Dave know what it's like to be tempted in the area of sexuality or sexual sin. You'll find the accounts of Joe and Dave in your Bible. We know them as Joseph and David. If you have your Bible with you today, turn to the second, the book of 2 Samuel, Open that up to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and once you get there, then go ahead and and put your thumb in there, and then open up to the first book of the Bible, uh, Genesis 39. So what we're going to do today briefly is we're going to compare Joe and his experience with Dave and his experience, or at least one experience that both of them had, 2 Samuel 11 and Genesis 39. First, we're going to start with Dave or David. Chapter 11, this is just four verses I'm going to share, and then I'm going to share more than that with Joseph because it's necessary to give you kind of the overarching gist of of the account. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. We're going to pause right there. So David, remember David? Dave Dave was a shepherd boy who was a very gifted shepherd boy who, who was pretty handy with the sling and protected his, his flock of sheep. As a boy, he also was an accomplished musician at a very early age and went to the palace where he would comfort the first king of Israel, King Saul, because King Saul had some, we would call them issues today, right? And so he was an accomplished musician. He was good with the sling. He was a pretty talented young man. He runs into this big dude named Goliath, right? We know that account. And that projects him into his future as a mighty warrior and then the king of Israel. Remember what I said about Dave? Dave loved the Lord. David loved the Lord. You see this through 2 Samuel. You know that you know that you know that David wanted to serve God. David was at his palace in Jerusalem while his army, the Israelite army, was out defeating the enemy. That's important to know. Now watch this. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, let me tell you what I know about Uriah the Hittite. He was one of the commanders of the Israeli army, of Israel's army. David was the boss of this man. David comes across this beautiful woman, asks who she is, and they say, she's the wife of one of your guys. Verse 4, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. There's a whole lot more to that account. We're going to talk a little bit about it in a minute. But that's the gist 
of what happened when David was confronted with an opportunity to be sexually impure. Now, let's go over to the 39th chapter of Genesis. We got Joe. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Joe. Joe, at 17 years old, was very gifted, very talented, had a bunch of brothers. There were 12 of them. His father's name was Jacob. Things were going pretty good for Joe, but his brothers were jealous of him because he was daddy's favorite. And so they beat him up and they threw him in a pit. You'll read this in, in Genesis and And then they decided, you know, we're not going to just throw him in a pit. We want some money for him. So they pulled him out of the pit and they sold him to some people who were traveling down to Egypt. So he entered the slave trade and he ended up at a house of a very important man as a slave. Watch this. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials. Pharaoh was the king of Egypt, the captain of the guard, so he was a pretty big deal, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So the Ishmaelites were the people who had bought him up in Israel, and they had sold him to Potiphar, a very important figure in the army of of, uh, the people who were in Egypt. So verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw what the Lord, that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. So he goes from slave to butler, okay, if you will. Joseph found favor and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything. Everybody say everything. Okay, you know what everything means in Greek? Everything. (laughs) Everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. So Potiphar brings him, makes him his butler, and and the more that Joseph hangs out with him, the better things get for Potiphar right? Pretty good gig for both of them. The blessing was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. He didn't have to worry about anything except for what was, what was for dinner. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph. Uh-oh, here we go and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns has been entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing except you from me because you are his wife. How then could I go do a wicked things such as this and sin against God. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. There's something important there. Or even be with her. Not talking about that today, but you can figure that one out. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Two guys, two guys, they both loved the Lord. They both were gifted and handsome, and they were both tempted. Now, this is important for me to point out to you because this is an immensely huge theological concept here. It is not a sin to be tempted. Let that marinate for a second. It is not a sin to be tempted. And if there's any part of you right now that says, I don't know if what that pastor's saying is, I don't know if I fully agree with that. All you need to do is turn to Matthew chapter 4, and it should be settled for you, okay? Because was Jesus sinless? Universal sign for yes as your head goes up and down like this. Was Jesus sinless? Yeah. Was Jesus tempted? Yeah. Okay. Matthew 4. 
in case you need that. They were both tempted. Being tempted is not a sin. But here's the deal. One of them ran from sin. And the other one opened the door to it. One of them ran from sin. The other one opened the door to it. And I mean both of those things in a literal and a figurative sense. Think about Joseph. He ran from sin. Figuratively, that means he stayed away from it, right? And literally, he literally ran from the sin. David, he opened the door to it. He figuratively opened the door to it because he entertained something he should have never entertained. And he literally opened his door for Bathsheba to come in. Two godly men, two very different results when it came to temptation. Now, there's a whole lot more that happens after this. Just a really quick review. Dave. David, as a result of this impregnated Bathsheba. She had a child. David, when he found out Bathsheba was pregnant, was not just guilty of sexual immorality, but he was guilty of either murder or manslaughter, depending on your legal understanding of what those things mean, because Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, being a commander in the army, David set up a plan to have him go to the front lines of battle against the enemy and then made an order for the rest of the army to retreat so that he was there by himself and he was killed. So was David guilty of just fornication? No. David had somebody in his life, though, that spoke the truth to him. This buddy's name was Nathan. He's a prophet you'll read about in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel. And Nathan confronted him about this sin. David, at that point in time, realized how far he had drifted from God. And I'll come back to David in just a minute. So, Joseph, Joe. Joe ran from the sin, didn't he? But remember the, how that account ended, Potiphar's wife was left holding his cloak in her hand. So she is very angry that she didn't get what she wanted. And so she made allegations of sexual misconduct, we'll say, against Joseph. He's thrown in prison. And so some people, if we stop there, say, wow, well, it doesn't sound like either one of them's story turned out very well. Well, in fact, both of them did because Joseph still had the hand of God on him and, and God gave him the ability to interpret a dream that got him out of prison and, and through a series of events that only God could orchestrate because of Joseph's faithfulness, because of Joseph wanting to be pure before God, he ends up being second in charge not of Potiphar's house, but of the entire country of Egypt, which sets the stage to rescue his entire family that was up in Israel from certain death because of famine. God rewarded Joseph for his faithfulness, okay? God allowed David to have a consequence. Going back to the story of David, David and Bathsheba were now a couple. He took Bathsheba as his wife. They had this child, and the child died. And David was left feeling the sense of loss guilt, 
shame. He had this friend Nathan come to him. Nathan pointed out the sin. David confessed his sin. I'm going to jump with you to Psalm chapter 51. One of the coolest Psalms in the whole Bible. This is David's reaction. This is David's prayer to God after he realized his sin. And I want to encourage you. I'm just going to gloss over it today. I want to encourage you to go back to Psalm 51. Any time in your life that you feel guilt, any time that you need to confess a sin to God, this is a beautiful prayer to pray. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I want to pause right there in verse 5. Do you hear what David said right there? He said something that, that contradicts what a lot of Christians today believe. If you were to survey Christians and you were to say to Christians, answer this question. Are we born good or are we born bad? There is a great amount of Christians who would say, well, we're born good and then we get bad. Okay, I, I always ask this question. Do you have to teach a two-year-old to lie? Hey, did you eat that cookie? Mm-mm. Okay. This is a huge theological statement. We're born sinful. Okay? We're born sinful because we have this disease called the sin nature in us, okay? All of us do. And some people will, will hear that and they'll say, oh no, well what happens then when a child dies if they're born sinful because the child isn't old enough to receive a relationship with Jesus to, to make a, a decision to give their life to Christ? Does that mean that they'll go to hell? And I'm like, no. Well, here's some Here's some scripture that will back that up. You go back here to 2 Samuel, and you read about David and Bathsheba in this David and Bathsheba in this child, and this child dying, and you read about David mourning the death of this child, and he makes this unbelievable statement that shows what happens to babies, small children, if they, if they die before they have an opportunity to make a conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ. David says this. He says, I can go to him, but he cannot come to me. Think about that. I can go to him, meaning that when I die, I can be re reunited with him, but he cannot come to me. That's huge. That's huge. Okay, back on to verse 6. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. And I love this next part. Listen, create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's a great verse to memorize. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew. When you renew something, you make it like new. And renew a steadfast spirit, that spirit that says, I'm steadfast, I'm committed to you, God. And then it, he says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then David goes on in the next verse to tell God that as a response to God forgiving him, that David will teach others about God. Really, really cool stuff. So for time's sake, we're going to end Psalm 51 there. If you're interested 
If you also go, you might want to write this down, to Psalm chapter 32. It's another psalm that David wrote as a response to this slip into sin that he found himself in. Sexual sin is a slippery slope, and many good people, even Christian people, fall into it. God created sex to be a beautiful thing between a man and a woman. God is a God of new beginnings, of forgiveness, of putting the past in the past. And God is a God that sees us as pure when we confess our sins. And when we turn, or that, that, that Christianese word is repent. Repent means to turn when we turn from our sin. And it's never too late to commit to sexual purity. There's so much freedom in that. There are so many people who they love God, they love God, but they're stuck in sexual sin. And it puts this wedge between them and God because they feel they can't look God in the face. God doesn't want us to feel that way. God wants to give us the freedom because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, every one of them. No matter what the past has been, be a Joseph. Flee from sexual sin. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for these friends here today. Thank you for helping us to hear hard things, hard truths. And Jesus, you never promised us that walking with you would be easy. In fact, you said if we're going to follow you, we have to bear a cross. You made it very apparent that, that it's going to be difficult to do what is right. But Lord, we just ask that you would create in us pure hearts and renew, bring new, a steadfast spirit within each of us. In Jesus' name, amen.